We will call to order the regular board meeting of the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago. Good morning. My name is Marisol Hernandez. I'm the chair. And with me today is Commissioner June Brown. Present. And Commissioner William Cressy. Also present. Thank you. Next item is consideration of the agenda. Any proposed changes? If not, we will proceed to the approval of the regular board meeting minutes of September 13th and September 27, 2022. <laughs> motion to approve. So moved by Commissioner Brown. And seconded by Commissioner Cressy. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item is the executive director's report, Mr. Holliday. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioner Brown and Commissioner Cressy. Early voting is now opening in all 50 wards. We voted 8,034 voters on opening day. We had to change the fifth ward early voting site late last week due to emergency accessibilities at Jackson Park. The fifth ward early voting site is now one block away at the South Side YMCA at 6330 South Stony Island. The fifth ward voters have been Staff is out in the area, flowering nearby buildings and residential centers, area businesses, and a press release was issued to the media. All old early voting signage has been pre-trial detainee voting started this weekend at the county jail. Clint Hurd was out on okay, him. Now, uh, Charles, now you're on both, I think. You're on the yeah. laptop and on the, so we're hearing an echo. Is okay. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Matt, could you help me? Please? I'm sorry. Clint Hurd was out this past weekend uh, at the jail with pre-trial detainee voting. On Saturday, 426 was voted. Sunday, 386 were a total of 812. They'll be out. They'll be back out this weekend to conclude pre-trial voting. De voting. All 1,290 voting precincts for November's general election has an assigned polling place. We are also doing a paper mailing to approximately 500,000 voters with different polling places than June 28 as a final safety net and communication to the voters. We staffed a ballot party at the Universal Soul Circus this weekend in Washington Park on Sunday and interacted with hundreds of people. I was present during most of the day, and it was a fun and family-oriented event. There was great interest from the teenagers and younger kids in how to use our voting equipment. Geneva Morris and Mashonda Tolliver from Community Service Department was on hand to demonstrate how the touchscreen voting worked, and also to recruit standby judges. Max and I met with two representatives from the Office of Democratic Institute and Human Rights, representing the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It was a short and productive meeting. <clears throat> we discussed how the board administer elections and discussed how it is easier than ever for people in Chicago to vote. On Saturday, I'll be speaking on early voting, same day registration, and deadlines pertaining to the November general election at November general election hosted by the Apostolic Church and Cole. Uh, Lance Goff is a member of Cole and he will also be on hand. So is my report, Madam Chair. Do we have any questions? I, I have a couple of uh, Mr. Uh, Holiday regarding when we were at the hearing, some things were put on the record and I was wondering if there's been, have we responded to the argument about those, like the cost saving amount, the manner of precinct cuts? And, yeah, uh, we, we left the frame. Yeah. Yes, we responded to the chair. They gave us a deadline, but I think all those questions that were asked have been responded to. Okay, can we get a copy or can I get a copy? Whoever wants a copy we'll, of that information? We'll forward you a copy. We'll forward okay. all the information. A copy as well. Yes. No, okay, no, and no, the, and I think at an earlier meeting, uh, I don't know if it was this one or, or the last two, 
one of the last two. You mentioned we would be getting an audit report. Do we have that? Well, it has been filed. With, I'm going over it now and okay. looking at and then responding to some of the questions that our management have, uh, had answered to kind of clarify some of those as, answers to the auditing team. Okay. It almost looks like we've received, I think, sort of a draft of the audit report because they're still requesting feedback from some of the departments. Yes. So and we that, have a we have a draft. Yes, and that information has been supplied, Adam. I'll give you a copy of what I was given on um, Friday, and, and we can supply the draft. Okay, and finally. Um, this may be a Mac, for, I'm not, uh, but I'm not sure. Not Mac, Max. Uh, but do you have any response or any update or any information for us regarding the NBC news report that came out yesterday? Last night, have you seen it? I'm happy to talk Matt about said, that. Matt sent out information on it. But do we have anything about the uh, next steps or the operational steps processes we may implement? To change this, or do you think there are no there's no need for change? I'm happy to address that in my report, or I can talk okay. about it right now, uh, Commissioner. Okay, I can wait until you okay. do that. But that's just that was a concern after I saw it. So, I was Commissioner Cassie. Okay, can, do you have anything? Y yes, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Brown uh, asked most of the questions I was going to ask about what a follow up on the audit report. Should we expect that when the report is finalized, the auditors will be meeting with the board uh, to present their report to us? Uh, I think that's the usual procedure. I would like that to be done. Even if I think that's something and I'll leave that up to general counsel. Uh, that's something that can be done in executive session, but uh, I'll leave it up to him to decide on that. But I'd like to be great if we could bring the auditors in when their report is finalized. Uh, the only other thing I can say, I'm happy to see that we've got our early voting sites and all the wards open. On Saturday, my wife and I stopped by uh, the sixth floor and early voted. And uh, we ran into Geneva Morris, who told us about the, uh, the Universe Soul Circus uh, event. Uh, I'm just concerned. I don't see Geneva here. And she didn't run off with a circus, did she, Charles? No, she she's here and she's actively down in community service working. Oh, well, that's, that's, re always. <laughs> that's reassuring. That's reassuring. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, then we'll proceed to Sandra Aspera, our Assistant Executive Director. Madam Chair, and good morning, Commissioner Cressy, Commissioner June. I don't think I can hear you well. Oh. It's kind of muffled, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, well, you just have to speak a little louder. Okay, okay I will. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Election Central, the space is reserved, staffing and layout, plans are pending completion, and language translators are in place. Ballot paper is secured for the 2023 municipal election, as well as sufficient amount of toner cartridges. The mock election was conducted on Thursday, October 13, and it was successful. As of this morning, the total number of vote by mail applications requested is 194,805, and the total number of vote by mail ballots returned is 33,606. These totals include 1,050 military and overseas applications and a total of 297 ballots returned. The last day to apply for a, for, for a vote by mail ballot is next Thursday, November 3rd. The last day to register to vote was October 11th and the last day to register to vote online was October 23rd. Race paid registration vote and voting started October 12th and will continue through election day, November 8th. The total number of ballots returned via the drop box as of October 23rd is 1,596. The processing of the vote by mail ballots started Friday, October 21st, and the ballots are being current are currently being scanned in the lower level. No tallies will be done until after 7 p.m. on election day. I also want to share the latest numbers for election judges and election coordinators. 
At the currently assigned election judges is 7,222. This includes 1,297 high school students. Pending to be uh, assigned is 983. Uh, active current assigned election coordinators is 1,290, representing one per precinct polling place. The total number of nursing homes participating this election is 90. We have processed a total of 1,930 applications. Staff has confirmed the voting day with each participating nursing home. Voting dates are November 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. Lastly, at the warehouse, the logic, the logic and accuracy of the poll book and voting equipment started last week, and we're ahead of schedule and have completed approximately 40%. The delivery of the blue ESE carriers at polling places will start this week. And this concludes my report. Thank you. Do the commissioners have any questions? I know. Yeah. Yes, um, uh, Sandra, the, the number of election judges, uh, is that a sufficient number of, for the election? Are we still looking for more judges? And will we have sufficient numbers of standby uh, judges? Because you know, with, with our new configuration, I think we should have a good body of standby folks that we can dispatch uh, out there from uh, Block 37. So we had a staff meeting yesterday. We have about approximately 63 standby judges. Um, we also have, um, I wish we, we have some precincts. I don't know, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I know certain wards uh, were low on judges, uh, but the judges department is securing uh, and looking for uh, judges to be assigned there as well. I think 13 ward, 14th ward, and there was another word I can't think of the top of my head, but I can send you a report. Okay, but what, what, and we're still, we'll, we're still processing judges. So you, you feel we'll have sufficient number of judges come election day? Yes, yes, we definitely will. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next um, is uh, Max Beber, our public information director. Thank you, Chair. A uh, few different updates and happy to address the NBC story that came out, Commissioner. Uh, the rest of the replacement voter cards uh, were shipped out over this weekend. Um, I know that those were a little bit sluggish, but um, the rest of those have been completed out of that mailing. Uh, but better news for our next mailing, the household polling place uh, mailer. That's the one that comes with information on early voting options, assigned precinct polling place, and vote by mail options for every registered household in the city. Uh, that finished mailing yesterday, uh, just slightly ahead of schedule the vendor gave us, and we'll start arriving in mailboxes this week. Uh, we've got our ad campaign uh, started for Has Your Polling Place Changed, as well as some early voting ads out there. Uh, we've got over $100,000 that's going towards this ad campaign, uh, especially a digital campaign for Has Your Polling Place Changed? That's live and running in the Sun Times, as well as a Citizen Newspaper, a TNT, a Cumulus Media, which includes radio and, um, and uh, an ad, a voice ad that's going out as part of that. Uh, we had a successful press conference yesterday uh, with the chair announcing the start of early voting in Chicago's 50 wards. We had all major television stations there as well as both papers uh, and uh, we'll be sending clips around again at the end of this week. And uh, Commissioner Brennan had brought up uh, an NBC report that aired the last night. Uh, we had worked with NBC for the better part of several months after the last election with FOIA requests, with fact checking requests and other requests. Um, you know, the, the story covered uh, what we faced, uh, election judge shortage for the last primary, which contributed to delayed polling place openings and most of the issues that we had faced uh, for the primary. Um, as Sandra mentioned, you know, what we're heading into November 8th uh, with election judges is a much smaller pool. And that is the solution that we pointed to for NBC and what we will be um, showing voters of Chicago for November is overstaffed polling places rather than understaffed polling places. Uh, we're currently ahead of the target 
Uh, that's 6,450 election judge target number. We're currently uh, ahead of that by 1,000 uh, once we get the other assigned judges placed. I know elect uh, the judge department is continuing to get as many election judges as possible to get ahead of any potential resignations or other attrition, uh, as well as a healthy standby judge number. Um, a goal again here is not to just have five election judges at every assigned precinct polling place, but possibly six even seven at locations, um, uh, if possible. Uh, so that is uh, is our main response towards um, questions about election judge and polling places. Um, in, in light of that story moving forward is the redistricting, the precinct consolidation, and the aggressive hiring of election judges is uh, was on our mind to, um, to have a much smoother November 8th, uh, considering that, so. I believe that's it for my report. Happy to um, clarify or take any questions. I have a question. <laughs> Did that uh, reporting coincide with what your finding were at, was after the uh, primary? Yes. Or I mean, the the unfortunate uh, matter was is that we had over three thousand election judge resign in the days leading up to and and on uh, election judge or on election morning. Um, we had just over six thousand judges when that target number should have been over 10,000, uh, even with standby judges. And uh, that created um, created a big problem for, for primary day. Um, what we're seeing, or at least I'm seeing in the media or talking with our friends at other election agencies is that many other election agencies are seeing this crunch of election judge shortage at this point. Um, it is something that is still on our mind uh, at the board and why we are, why the judges department is still very aggressively going after even after hitting this target number but part of the amount of questions the amount of uh, maybe heat that we've uh, taken over precinct consolidation um, this the main benefit uh, for voters of chicago and the board i think this message is now coming through is that the board did take bold action um, when it came to combining precincts uh, not necessarily to remove physical polling place locations, but to decrease that pool of judges needed so we can have a stronger pool, um, a strong, uh, a strongly trained pool of judges um, rather than keep um, keep needing to chase after an additional 4,000 that can be continually difficult. Um, so uh, given, given the amount of growing pains and uh, the amount of time that we spent communicating polling place changes and precinct consolidation changes, um, that's still, I think, the main talking point for us coming out of this is that this action and the uh, combination of precincts um, will have a very positive effect for November 8th in leading us to overstaff precinct polling places for the upcoming election, as well as the February and April 2023 elections. That's what I was hoping to hear, overstaffing so that should the need arise, we can react immediately and it's not a gap. Is that what you're telling me? Absolutely. That's kind of in line with what Commissioner Cressy was asking, I think. Absolutely, and and knowing that it's a redistricting year on top of any precinct changes, given that many voters will be finding themselves within new wards, we know at the board that we're the first to break that news to many voters, uh, even though that you know we don't create the city ward map, um, but that having additional election judges and staff at polling places to be able to direct voters to their appropriate location or let them know of their uh, vote center options, all the early voting sites that are open on election day, um, having additional election judges and staff to be ready for November 8th to communicate uh, these important changes. Okay, yep. so we're, we're feeling good about that. Okay. Yep. And Max, if, if I could just comment on that as well. I think one of the problems we had with the primary this year on the judges is um, the fact that when these these uh, individuals signed up to be judges maybe a year or two years in advance, they were fully expecting the schedule of elections, which had been traditional, where originally the primary election was scheduled for March 15, and uh, during the school year, the kids would be in school and all that, and then our friends down Springfield moved it to June 28. Eighth at the end of June, in the middle of summer, and I, I, I know personally a number of judges who said, I just can't do it that time of year. That's not when I expected the primary to be. Okay. So fortunately, 
the general election in you know in November, the second Tuesday in November is where everyone expected to be. So I think I'm hoping and I'm expecting we'll have a lot fewer dropping out for this November general election than we did with the rescheduled <laughs> moved around primary election. You're, Thank you're, you. You're very correct, Commissioner. I uh, I am glad that NBC did air a good amount of that conversation I, I had with Marianne Ahern about. June 28th being a challenging date for election judges. And I think they saw from their FOIA documents of resignation letters and and emails that uh, the summer date was hard uh, for much more judges comparatively to much better known March and November dates for gubernatorial years. Um, so again, I think you know, the amount of resignations we've seen so far and the amount of judges signing up, I think also speaks to November being a better date um, for many judges and hopefully less of attrition. But given how hard the judges department has worked, um, you know, I think we've got a lot of cover for any additional attrition while still being overstaffed. I'll keep my fingers cross crossed in any event. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, we're always looking to improve, um, you know, um, and, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very, I feel very good that this is going to be, um, a very good election and we'll have um, all the resources we need um, out there. Um, thank you. Um, now we'll proceed uh, to old business infrastructure projects and changes in election administration um, and voting equipment. Mr. Holiday. Nothing, Madam Chair. Uh, everything is on schedule. All the equipment has been prepped and ready for the upcoming election. And how about uh, uh, the poll books? Uh, the same with the e poll books. Okay, Mr. Lasker, legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. Um, still, the legislature has not been in session, so we're we're looking towards the veto session they have scheduled for November fifteenth, <clears throat> November twenty ninth to December first. I think we all heard some quite strong support uh, when we were at the Chicago City Council for the budget hearing. We heard some strong support from the aldermen, the alder persons, uh, to get legislation that would allow us to keep our early voting sites open on election day for the February municipal election. Right now, that law doesn't exist. So, um, Mr. Holiday and Mr. Bever and I are working to get a letter out <clears throat> from Mr. Holiday to some legislators and also hoping those alder persons continue to show their support as well. But that's it for now on legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, we yeah, have one time. question for Adam on the legislation to uh, to keep those uh, early voting sites open on election day as vote centers. Um, are we seeing any other support uh, from, say, the state board of elections or the county, anything like that? I have discussed the matter with leadership at the State Board of Elections and they recognize how important it is to us and they did tell me that they that the State Board would support that legislatively as well. Um, so, and we know that there's a pilot program going on in Kane County. We know that DuPage County has been uh, seeing a lot of value in their vote centers. Um, I think Lake County up where I live as well. So it's, it is, there are smaller jurisdictions that have told us they don't really have a demand for it. So that's fine. That's why the legislation we would encourage would be permissive, not mandatory. If, if you've got a smaller, smaller areas, they might not need it nearly as much as large jurisdictions like ours. Under, understood. Okay, it'd be great to have some the support on the record from those other folks. Thanks so much, Adam. If there are no further questions, then um, let's proceed to new business. And the first item on the agenda is uh, an emergency procurement with marquee event rentals for precinct tables and chairs. Who will speak to this? I can speak to that, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair, fellow commissioners. Uh, this is a request to ap approve an emergency purchase with marquee event rentals for the rental storage delivery and pickup of tables and chairs for our polling places and other designated voting sites for the November 8th election. Um, just a little background on this. Um, as you're aware, our original contract uh, was awarded to RMS Movers. They defaulted on that contract. 
and uh, we went out for an emergency bid as a result. Um, that bid was awarded to Midwest Movers. Uh, the price that Midwest Movers uh, submitted when their final invoices came in, it was quite um, higher than what they originally quoted us. So a decision was made uh, to no longer use Midwest Movers and to move forward with another vendor. Uh, with that, I looked at the other two bids that we received, as well as a, a third vendor, which is Marquee Event Rentals. They were our vendor who we actually rented the chairs from last um, in June. And they came forth with not only um, the bid for rental, but for also the pickup and delivery for the tables and chairs for this election. And they were um, by far the lowest bidder for this contract uh, with an ask of 176,468 for all of the areas A, B, C, and D. The term of this project will actually begin today. They actually need to start delivering today, but we needed to bring this forth uh, for your approval, hopefully. And uh, we are being assured that they will have all the tables and chairs delivered on or before November 7th. Uh, this contract will expire November 25th, and the uh, plan is to go out for a new bid for uh, tables and chairs for the February election. Thank you. That is my request today. J just to clarify the amount that you quoted, that's for the rental of the equipment and for the delivery and the pickup of all that equipment. Correct. Wow. Which, okay. which last time uh, the bid was quoted at 161,000 and that did not include the rental of the tables and chairs. Okay, so, thank so, you. Thank you. When thank was you. this bid? At, when was this bid at Ms. Wells? The, the original bid was right before our June election. Uh, that was an emergency bid right before our June election after RMS uh, defaulted on the contract. Okay. Any other questions? If not, uh, is there a motion to authorize the executive director to execute a contract with Marquee Event Rentals for the rental and cartage of tables and chairs and related services with a term beginning October 25th, 2022 and continuing through November 25th, 2022 with a total cost not to exceed $176,468.27. So moved by Commissioner Cressy. Seconded by Commissioner Brown. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the um, Approval to exercise the first option to renew a contract with CDW Government LLC slash net woven for the creation of contract and procurement management and uh, programs. Who can speak to this? I will speak to this as well. Um, this is a request to exercise the first option to renew with CDWG slash net woven. This is for our customized automated software application. A project for procurement, budget and finance, and contract management. Uh, CDWG has been working with us over the last year through our um, election process. So we've we've had some some downtime where we've been trying to get these systems up and running. Uh, but because of the the ongoing elections, it's it's been quite challenging. But I'm happy to report that uh, the procurement module that they're working on with us, we're about 95% complete. That module will consist of an automated procurement process where we will generate uh, requisitions and POs through this process. It will have a multi-level department approval. So now our, our paper-based process consists of a requisition that is a paper requisition that is um, filled out and hand delivered for approval to first uh, the manager, then our finance director, and then either Charles or Sandra. So that that process will be automated and and uh, through an online procurement system will be approved that way, as well as the generation of a purchase order. We will also have the ability to um, 
run ad hoc reporting and queries to find out where at any given time where we are with regard to our spend against our different contracts. So that's the procurement module with the budget and finance module. We will have defined annual budgets in the system for the city of Chicago and Cook County. Our budget manager will be able to identify budget lines associated with all of our purchases. Um, we will be able to review the purchase orders and subtract those allocations. So any given time, we should know what we have uh, budgeted for on those lines and what's been purchased and be able to report on that. Uh, we will also have uh, the ability to enforce spend limits against our contracts. So there should be no um, overspending on any of our contracts through this, this automated system. And we will also have the ability to track our grants and report on our grant spending under the budget and finance module. With the contract module, this will be a repository for all of our active contracts with start and end dates for each contract. We will get system alerts that in advance that will tell us when a contract is expiring and that will allow for better planning and notification to our to our board members. Um, we will have the ability to, to capture any renewals, our contract values, and the dollars spend again against these contracts. We will be able to report online any sole source contracts, uh, PSA contracts, our professional services agreements, as well as our MWBE um, information. So we'll be able to have all of those reporting capabilities and functionalities throughout the system. Those two modules, the budget and the contract module, were about 65% complete. Uh, there, they've been, there's been ongoing meetings with um, procurement, with, with finance, and with um, our contract team, which consists of Adam and Trish. Trish excuse me. And um, we are hopeful to have a go live date for all three modules uh, for January 2nd, 2023. So with that, I ask that we extend this term for uh, uh, an additional year that will begin November 1st, 2022, expire October 31st, 2023. We will then have one additional year for uh, renewal and the total spend on this project that we're asking for is $173,209. Madam Chair, if I could just make a quick comment. Um, I have been uh, attending several of the meetings to, to brainstorm the ideas. I'm, I'm very excited about what this program is going to do for the board. I, I really uh, am optimistic it's going to help bring a lot of uh, cohesion to the whole process. There's so many different cooks in the kitchen when it comes to different procurements, and this is a way that we can all work together. So I'm excited about it. There's actually, I've got a, a training and testing session scheduled for next week, so I get to get finally, you know, get in there and kick the tires a little bit. Um, so uh, I, I also, I, I second the, the thought that we should continue on with this contract and get this program finished. I think it'll be great. Thank you. I, I have a question regarding the uh, timeline. I thought this was a, if I remember correctly, a one year project to set it up. So now are we in the final implementation since you said it was, I think 95% done? We are in the final stages and, and um, Commissioner Brown, you are correct. However, with our June election, we had to pretty much table everything that we were doing and, and concentrate on the election for June. And so now uh, we're, again, we're, we're headed, you know, to the November election, but we have been using those off times in those months to try and get this project moved ahead as quickly as we can. So we are a little behind schedule, but we're looking forward to a January 2nd, 2023 go live date. I'm sorry, and to uh, we we've expanded um, on the budget side. A, a lot of things that we originally didn't include for budget has been included. So that that also has taken some additional time. But but we're confident that we'll be we'll meet that January deadline. And I was I was just going to add on that I, I, even I was not uh, expecting it to be such a detailed process. I mean we have put in so many little detailed nuts and, and bolts and special bells and whistles in this program. So it's taken a little while, but I, that's what has me so uh, optimistic and excited about the final product. If, 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 I, if I may just add, um, 
Uh, I, I can't say I'm not a little bit disappointed that we don't have it up and running. I think mostly because I am so looking forward to us coming barreling into the 21st century uh, with with these uh, systems. Uh, but I do know that, especially coming from where we've been coming from to this system, it is a heavy lift. So yeah. I'm not really surprised that we're going to need a little bit extra time on this. But uh, I'm really looking forward to the result. It, it, it makes this business professor commissioner's heart very happy. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, um, is there a motion to exercise the board's first option for renewal of its contract with CDW Government yeah. LLC for continued development and implementation by NetWoven of a com custom computer system for management and administration of the board's contracts and procurements with an extended term beginning November 1st, 2022 and running through October 31st, 2023 with a total cost not to exceed one hundred and seventy three thousand two hundred nine dollars. Is there a motion? So moved by Commissioner Brown. I was making my notes. Okay, and seconded by Commissioner Cressy. Happily moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. For Commissioner Brown votes present. I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my notes. <laughs> and Commissioner Cressy votes both present and I as well. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, an engagement agreement with Tressler LLP for legal representation. Mr. Lasker. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. As, as you all well know, the, the, the bylaws to authorize me to in, enter into contracts for legal representation for the board, but I'd just like to have them ratified in a public meeting like this. Um, Tressler LLP has a team that's uh, headed by here by Charles Lemoyne, uh, and we've got some other, some other partners and associates working with us. You'll meet them uh, today. We're gonna have an executive session to discuss our pending uh, litigation. Uh, they've got ample uh, experience in the federal court, and I'm very pleased with the way they've picked up this case quickly. Uh, to get on the ball and keep things moving. So I, I do request the ratification of the contract. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to ratify the board's attorney contractor agreement with Tressler LLP for legal defense and representation at the rate of 295 an hour plus authorized expense reimbursements with a term beginning October 7, 2023 and running through the completion of the litigation? So 2023 and 2022. Oh. It turned October beginning 7. October 7, 2022. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Went into a time warp for a moment there. Um, uh, so moved by Commissioner Cressy. Seconded by Commissioner Brown. Happily moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say that. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Thank you. Next, we'll go to a legal report. Mr. Lasker. Uh, thanks again, Madam Chair. Uh, we've got over 30 attorneys now who have uh, sent in acknowledgements to serve in Election Central for this upcoming election day. So um, that's a, a higher number. I think that we talked about election judge shortages uh, last in June, and I, we saw that with some of the attorneys too who were on vacations and so forth and just couldn't uh, attend the Election Central. So we've got higher numbers now. That includes some new, uh, new attorneys from last time. Uh, so working on their training right now uh, for our briefing that we're gonna have before the election, uh, obviously going to focus that on the, the new precincts, the new legislative districts and so forth. I'm anticipating a lot of questions about that. And that includes uh, beefing up the training on provisional ballots, on how we can avoid having voters uh, cast provisional ballots if they end up at the wrong precinct. I think important for Election Central to remember that there are 52 places in the city of Chicago that every voter is going to be able to go to on election day, should they. Uh, and then, so there's a lot of choices, even though the precinct might be in a new location. We've also been hearing a lot of reports lately from national figures that I, I believe they think they're doing the right thing, but under Illinois law, they're encouraging voters to do things that can cause problems for the voters. And that specifically is some national statements to bring your vote by mail ballot to the precinct with you on election day. And so I just wanna take this opportunity to remind our voters that while that is the way it used to work in Illinois with absentee voting like 30 years ago, the law has changed here long ago. Now that we have uh, mail-in, no excuse mail-in voting, you must return your ballot to the board, either through the post office, 
through our drop boxes, which we will have at the vote centers and at the um, early voting sites, but we do not have drop boxes at all the precincts. And then the only other way to bring it to us is by personal delivery to our office. So we are not, the, the election judges are not allowed to gather or, or accept vote by mail ballots at the precinct. So we strongly discourage anyone from bringing their vote by mail ballot to the precinct unless they want to spoil that vote by mail ballot and then they can vote there at the precinct. Um, so just that's the, my reminder there. Uh, secondly, I want you um, to all be aware that we have a new presiding judge in the county division of the Cook County Circuit Court. Uh, that is the, the division of approximately a, a dozen or maybe 15 judges who, um, among other things, they hear all of the election cases, election law related cases in Cook County. Uh, the new presiding judge is Raina Marie Van Tyne. Uh, yesterday morning, I, I had a meeting with her uh, in her chambers for over an hour, along with uh, our my counterpart in the county clerk's office, Jim Nally. It was a wonderful meeting. The judge invited us over. We talked a lot about um, you know the procedures of how the election cases work, both the judicial review of electoral board cases, which is the largest numbers on their dockets, but also things like uh, polling place, late closures, uh, the administrative function of appointing uh, election judges and so forth. So um, Judge Van Tyne has uh, about, about 20 years experience on the bench, but it, uh, has not handled any of the election cases. She's new to the county division, but I uh, left the meeting feeling very optimistic that our agency will continue to have a, a good relationship with the court when it comes to working together on uh, procedures and local rules that can help streamline the system and make it better for the litigants and better for the board. Um, so I, I thank the judge for, for that meeting. Um, and that concludes my legal report for today. Okay, thank you. Um, if if I may, Madam Chair, I, I just need a a, a clarification uh, from the general counsel. Um, I've been getting a lot of inquiries with regards to uh, COVID uh, vaccine requirements, and specifically for three classes of individuals. First, the the uh, election day precinct judges of election, uh, the uh, early voting site election officials, and the credentialed poll watchers. And, and if I could take the first and, and third first, um, our election day precinct election judges, they're described in state statute and they are uh, you know, a, appointed by the court or confirmed by the court, and as such, they're really not employees of the board. Is that correct? That's correct under under the legal philosophy that they are appointed by the circuit court, uh, paid by the county. More importantly, what, what it is is that the election code sets their statutory um, eligibility requirements. It is state statute, state law says if you want to serve as an election judge, you have to be a citizen, a registered voter with, you know, um, it, it does not say that you have to be vaccinated in the election code. And that's that's a state law issue where our Board of Elections had no authority to, to change those eligibility requirements, just like we couldn't change the age you have to be to run for governor or something like that. Right. Now so that we're, we're, okay. Well, so the goes, third, the <laughs> well, finish your thought, Adam. No, that's just it. We've got eligibility requirements for the election judges that we're not allowed to change. Right. And the segue to the other categories, uh, for example, early vote. What was this, the next oh, category? Well, I wanted to do uh, the, the, the credentialed poll watchers. Uh, the political sure. parties and the candidates and civic organizations can you know, come to us, receive credentials to have poll watchers to be in the polls and, and, and watch the proceedings, observe. Uh, and again, they're not employees of the board. We, we can't control them, correct? Well, not only are they not employees of the board, but they, you know they're not paid anything. They're under no contract. They're controlled by the groups that they represent. We we don't even right. know who they are until they. The, the election code statutes expressly say we're not allowed to ask a political party, for example, who are you going to send in as a as a poll watcher. We cannot ask them that ahead of time. They show up with their credentials filled out with their name on it, and we meet them theoretically. We meet them for the first time. So yeah, right. we have no control over them, no authority legally uh, to change the eligibility requirements. 
And the final group, uh, and this is the one I think that's causing most of the questioning I'm receiving, is the um, early voting site election officials. As I understand it, under state statute that created the early voting, uh, these can be and for our purposes are employees of the board. And further, there is a case law that has said that board employees are to be considered, even though we're a separate legal entity, separate governmental entity from the city of Chicago, they are to be considered as if they were employees of the city uh, and entitled all the rights and privileges and duties thereof, and that would include the vaccine mandate, correct? Yeah, so that's correct. For you know, the courts on other matters have ruled. For example, they're in, entitled to workers' compensation and so forth that the city employees would get. So they're they're these are called election officials. That's what the election code calls them. The election code gives an election authority the option to use election judges to run its early voting sites or election officials. Um, for most years, this board has used the, the election officials model, and they are our employees. They are directed by us. The city of Chicago has a, a vaccine mandate for its employees. This board has previously followed suit with that and for its own employees has a vac vaccine requirement. And now these election officials fall under that category. So that's why they're uh, required to have the vaccine. Uh, I would also point out there's when you use your election officials to run the early voting sites, there's no statutory requirement in the election code that they be of any particular political party. However, this board, since long before I got here, has worked uh, every year with the political parties uh, to, to try to recruit adequate numbers from both of the two state leading uh, political parties, including uh, as recently as this, this summer, as in, in the lead up to this November election, we sat down with attorneys and leadership from both of the political parties um, and, and working together on recruitment efforts like this to make sure that we've got some uh, in every location. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, uh, uh, Council. Sure, thank, thank you. Thank you. Now we'll proceed to the financial report. We have a balance sheet and voucher listing for the City of Chicago at 2022 appropriation number 22-07, dated October 25th, 2022, in the amount of $938,818.50. Is there a motion to approve? So moved by Commissioner Brown. Seconded by Commissioner Cressy. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Now we have a balance sheet and voucher listing for the County of Cook 2022 appropriation number 22-07 dated October 25th, 2022 in the amount of 1,272,000 $156.94. Is there a motion to approve? So moved by Commissioner Cressy. Seconded by Commissioner Brown. Motion uh, uh, properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Thank you very much. Now we'll proceed to public comment. Do we have any public comment for today? We have not received any, excuse me, we have not received any requests for public comment today. I see a caller number two. Who is that again? Um, this is um, Claire Tobin. I don't know if I am um, number four. being heard. Yes, you are being heard, Claire. Oh, thank you. Okay, so because I I happened to come down to pick up some of the manuals this morning, and so I was going to stop by for the um for the uh, meeting, because I didn't realize it was not an in-person meeting. So I'm sitting in the office right now. So I would, if uh, it allows me um, to make, um, have some questions, that would mm -hmm. be very helpful. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Um, so my question relates to the decrease in the number of accessible uh, precincts and, um, I just uh, I'm confused about it because my impression was that beginning in 2017 there was a big effort to, um, to make uh, many most of the precincts you know accessible, and um, the other question then is that there has been talk saying that um, 
some of those precincts will be uh, made accessible for the municipal election. So I'm I'm confused as to how <laughs> accessible uh, precincts can disappear and well, appear I, I, in a couple okay. of months. I'm a little confused by your question in the decrease in the number of accessible precincts. Um, uh, can uh, no, so it, it appears on the... looking on the website that um, many of the like considering you know the high schools and and other um, locations that have been traditionally have had precincts um, that we know are accessible for many years. They're listed as being non not accessible. So I don't. Um, this is confusing. You can address this if you'd like. Uh, yes, please. Uh, it had been spoken before, uh, as we spoke at the uh, uh, council uh, budget hearing, a lot of those places, they're considered usable. There are some instances where there are some things that are being done to make them fully accessible. So they weren't listed as accessible, but they are usable. And those city agency, as some of these schools and parks, are being updated and things are being uh, put in place to make them fully accessible. Um, thank you, Mr. Lasker. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a, as a part of the settlement with the Department of Justice that the board has been under since 2016 or 17 on accessibility, uh, we've been surveying, we and Equip for Equality and city agencies and the Department of Justice itself have all been surveying all these sites for accessibility. And so as a site gets surveyed, you might find technical violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which then requires us under state law, we're supposed to, put, to post whether a site is accessible or inaccessible, and that's black and white, yes or no, it's, a, it's a binary options, accessible or inaccessible. Now, we have found, for example, the, the example the attorney from the Department of Justice likes to use is you might have a, a crack in the sidewalk that's half an inch high. And under the Americans with Disabilities Act, that's an infraction. So it gets, that site gets red flagged. There's a sidewalk that needs to be repaired. And then all of a sudden it shows up on our website as quote unquote inaccessible because the law says we're supposed to list whether it's accessible or inaccessible. Um, so we've been again, trying to comply with these statutes, but at the same time, we're working now to, to improve the communication on what's truly usable. We've got an agreement from the Department of Justice that um, they, you know, they know the conditions of these places. It's got a staircase. We're not calling it usable because you can't get a person with disability down that staircase. But we've only got about 40 locations throughout the whole city that still have any stairs in them. Um, so there, there have been some changes in what's listed as accessible or non-accessible as the um, surveys continue to happen. But we're also currently in the process of working to improve our messaging so that, as, as our friend from the Department of Justice says, that half inch crack in the sidewalk is not going to stop someone, whether they're in a wheelchair or blind using a cane, that's not going to stop the person from being able to use that location. We have other locations that have technical violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act because, for example, the door might be too heavy to pull open under the, Amer under the ADA. Well, but we're going to put a door stop out there or a doorbell or have a person there to open the door for voters. We do temporary remedies like that. There are water fountains that hang more than six inches off the wall and don't go all the way down to the floor. And that's a technical violation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But we put a traffic cone underneath that uh, water fountain in the hallway on election day, and now it's technically usable. So there, there's, uh, it, it's just, it's a much more complicated process than what the statutes have really authorized us, us to say in our reports. But we now have, you know, uh, an agreement with the Department of Justice that what really matters is communicating to the voters whether it's usable or not. So that's what we're doing. We're working on that, and that will provide much better messaging for the February election. Okay. Uh, the vast majority of the polling places that are listed on our website as inaccessible are very much usable by a person in a wheelchair or a blind person with a cane. So what uh, what you've said, uh, Mr. Lasker, is in line with what was what was said at the uh, council hearing that 96% is in compliance, full compliance with ADA for the DOJ. Is that what you're telling? So we do have that. No, I'm not saying that 96% are in full compliance with the ADA. 
but it's that 96 percent of them the infractions are so technical and, and minor the a wheelchair ramp we have several locations where there is a good wheelchair ramp it happens to be like three quarters of a degree too steep but our our advocate our experts that we're working with in the disability field tell us that that is actually not a barrier to that person getting in with the wheelchair it's a technical violation and we have to report it as such okay. but it is still usable realistically reasonably usable by the people with disabilities okay. so so by def by the definition of accessible a lot of these places are technically considered inaccessible but the vast majority are usable and and we're working with again we're we're not the landlord of all these places but we're working with them especially since most of them are city locations on making them first temporarily you know completely usable and possibly accessible and then down the line permanently accessible we have there are over 400 locations that are currently under construction for permanent remedies at schools, at park district buildings, at libraries, other city owned or public government owned buildings. Yeah. Wonderful, because that's 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 that good so 365. I, I, yeah. Thank you. Good luck. I'll so see you I, I have a suggestion um, to kind of um, reassure people that maybe you on the website list these as not technically accessible but usable i mean i it seems to me that that would really cover yourselves uh better um that's the agreement that we've now reached with the department of justice and that's what we're working on doing okay so you're going to change the change the website then to say uh not technically accessible but usable something along those lines yes the word usable is is, is a word that's been expressly you know approved i guess by in our, in our consultations with the Department of Justice. We have to list them as okay. there's a technical violation, so they have to be listed as inaccessible, but they also can be listed now as, as usable. Okay, great. And can I have another question too? Um, sure. Another area of concern is just the discrepancy between the consolidation of precincts in some of the wards. Um, for instance, the 49th ward um, has reduced from, you know, I don't know, 40 or more down to 17. And some of the other wards are have still have about 40 uh, locations. So um, that appears, you know, to be a huge um, unexplainable kind of difference as to how those uh, consolidations uh, of precincts took place. I think you're looking at the number of precincts that there were under the old ward map and comparing that to the number of precincts that there are under the new ward map and the geography of every, of every ward has changed. So that is one of the several factors that can uh, create, you know, discrepancies comparing apples to oranges. But there's a lot of factors that go into that. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, I, I don't think you can compare, Claire, every ward and, and say every ward should have 30 precincts or every ward should have 15 pre, uh, precincts. And, you know, it takes a lot of, uh, it would took a lot of time and effort to figure out, you know, uh, going back to accessibility, ex, uh, accessible buildings, um, the number of voters in, in each precinct, in each area, um, as well as uh, accessibility to things like public transit and, um, you know, see if there are any expressways, you know, in, in, in the area. So it's not as easy as saying every ward should have the same number of precincts. Well, I wouldn't expect it to be the same number because, um, you know, even, geography, even, as you mentioned. Even close to, I mean, you're you're talking about totally different precincts, uh, wards with totally different configurations. Um, so, uh, any other questions, Claire? Um, no, I appreciate your uh, trying to answer the question, but I'm I, I still just feel that um, there. It's kind of strange that a, a ward that previously had maybe 40 
now only has 17, whereas a ward that previously had 40 uh, locations still has 40 locations. So I, I'm just, uh, I haven't looked at it in detail, but it just well, summarily. I, I, I think there's only one ward that still has 40 and there are, you know, various, you know, the one that has, you know, been cut down, they might, I know one of the things that is, is some of our wards have a lot of railroad tracks going through and some don't, and that will cause havoc. So there's a lot of things that went into this drawing and plus it's, it's, it's a lot of these are still under consideration. So, um, yeah. I think I think our folks did a really fine job with this. And and I don't really see any new wards with 40 precincts. So well, I don't know where where Well, Madam where, Chair, it's yeah. it's only one and that one we will address after the November election, but every ward has been reduced. Every ward was reduced in precincts, so there is no ward that have the same number of precincts that they had in June. Every ward was was reduced. Okay. And as you say, okay, thank this, you. Is a, this is a work in progress, Claire. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, do we have any other public comment? Could I say something? This is Don yes. Olson. Mm -hmm. uh, just in to this issue of fewer precincts, um, a number of years ago, I designed my own election system for Chicago, and in my system, uh, there were a lot fewer voting locations in every ward. And what I came up with at that time was that there should be an average of 14 to 15 voting locations in every ward. And my preference would be that there were 14 to 15 precincts as well. Um, and as an example, in the 33rd ward where I live, we had 28 precincts, but we had only had 14 voting locations, and here that worked very well. So I, I think there were more voting locations than necessary in lots of wards. And one thing we did when we kind of looked at this was uh, we were looking at different locations, and we saw that Ontario, I think it was Ontario, if I'm remembering correctly, um, decided that they were having a lot people to work their polling places, getting enough people. And they uh, did some really interesting things. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but they did some interesting things to be able to run their elections with fewer personnel. And we looked at what they had done and it was very interesting and it kind of inspired me that uh, personnel on election day could be used in very different ways. So I'm mm -hmm. just throwing the table. Thank you. Um, are there, is there any other um, public comment? No? Okay. Well, if there is no public comment, uh, Mr. Lasker, we do have a need for executive session um, to discuss uh, litigation. Is that correct? Yes, pending litigation. So I'm going to log off now and go open up the executive session meeting while you do your motion to, to go there, okay? Okay, um, and just so everyone knows, we will only be uh, discussing the litigation. We are not going to um, have to vote on anything. So when we come out of executive session, what will happen is we'll probably go straight to adjournment. Okay, uh, but we will come back out into open session once we finish, we'll log back into this WebEx um, and into open session. Okay, so is there a motion at this point um, to go into executive session to discuss pending litigation? So moved by Commissioner Brown. And seconded by Commissioner Cressy. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. Aye. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Motion passes and uh, thank you everyone. Maybe we'll see you again and we, we will now exit for executive session. Thank you. Uh, we are back now in open session and we have, uh, this is Maricel Hernandez, the chair, um, and we have uh, with us June Brown. Present. And William Cressy. Present. And uh, so uh, we, um, we have all the commissioners here. Um, there was no just uh, vote taken in closed session. Um, and um, there is nothing to uh, vote upon here in 
in open session. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, so, so moved, and I think it's until 7 a.m. on election day, or do we just um, call the chair? Um, yeah, it's at the call of, um, we, yeah, uh, the, the we'll next do the schedule. call of the chair. This, yeah. Sure, sure. That, 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 that is the set, that, that is the next board meeting as well. Uh, okay. Um, is there a second? Second it, Commissioner Brown. Okay. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please state aye. Commissioner Cressy votes aye. Commissioner Brown votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you on election day, if not sooner, at the call of the chair. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.